is an extremely important uh, topic. Everybody in this room is affected by healthcare, and so we have a panel of distinguished guests. Uh, my name is Jeff Schwarty. I'm the Chief, Chief Equity Strategist for Simplify. I joined in April after a 30-year career at Principal. So with me on my left is Lean Kawas from uh, Propel Bio Partnership, and then we have uh, Mike Taylor. Uh, Mike Taylor is from uh, Critical Mass Partners. So I'll have each of you do a proper introduction of yourself, and then we'll go into the discussion. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you, Jeff, and thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, so I, being in the healthcare, I started my career, I don't know, over 20 years ago as a pharmacist. And as Jeff highlighted, I've seen firsthand the impact of innovative therapies on people's life. Uh, and, and that really drove me into wanting to do more. And then I went into the research of drug development and I founded a company. I took a public, raised over $400 million. Um, and then I left the company and Richard Kane, who was one of the largest investors in my previous company, asked me to launch a healthcare investment firm for two reasons. One, um, if you're following the markets, uh, around three years ago, we've started seeing a downturn in, in uh, healthcare and, and biotech in specific, small uh, micro and mid cap companies. Um, it was, didn't discriminate basically uh, if it was a good company or a bad company, uh, the whole market went down and he's an opportunistic investor. The second part, as he said, he found the right talent to help him make the investment. Uh, so we launched Propel Biopartners with the idea that we wanted to invest in uh, small, uh, micro, and, and up to mid-sized companies. Um, currently, we're also sub-advising Surrey, which is a healthcare investment uh, firm that focuses on, on, on this specific arena. Uh, I'm going to hand it off to Mike. Hey, thank you very much. I'm Mike Taylor. Uh, I ran uh, healthcare money for uh, the past 25 years, uh, mostly in the hedge fund arena. Uh, and that's where that critical mass partners come from. That's just my family office name at the moment. Uh, but for the most part, I ran it uh, millennium uh, in a uh, neutral, uh, true gunslinging hedge fund fashion. Uh, it's been a wonderful ride. But really, it's time for me to give back. And this is part of that giving back. Great. Thank you for the introductions. As I mentioned, uh, all of us have some sort of direct connection with healthcare, either for ourselves or a family member. This is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and I think next week we'll be handing a check to Susan G. Combs. You know, just a little bit of a background as we before we get into the detailed discussions. I mean, healthcare is a a theme that um, is has been a, a phenomenal place to invest. Uh, by 2030, it's estimated that every baby boomer will be 65 years and older. So what that means is we're, we're about to see a significant impact on the healthcare system as this biggest demographic is starting to age out, right? And so that's a, something to keep in mind that the, the boomers impacted housing, they Im impacted infrastructure, they impacted financial services. Now they're coming into the healthcare, into the life type uh, services. And so that's a big deal to kind of keep, back, keep in the back of your mind. Also, about 60% of all adults in the United States have at least one chronic disease, whether it's uh, diabetes, um, uh, uh, chronic health issues with their heart, or obesity. So that's a, that's a big issue to kind of keep in mind as well. And the U.S. economy, uh, the U.S. spends about four, $4 trillion, $4 trillion a year on healthcare services, which represents nearly 20% of GDP. So this is a space that you, you can't ignore. It, there's a tremendous amount of opportunities in this space. And then one in five Americans will expend, experience some sort of mental health issues. And so that's the, the opportunity set that we have. There's a, there's a tremendous amount of tailwinds coming into the space. And since 1995, over the last 30 years, healthcare has outperformed the S&P 500. And so it's an opportunity for us to kind of share. Uh, what I thought we would do is, since Lean kind of operates in that small, micro, mid-cap space, that's where some of the most innovative things occur. And then we'll turn it over to Mike to kind of talk about investment process related to the commercial aspect of the investment landscape. So, Lean, when we, when we think about biotech investing, and I had a biotech fund at Principal, it's pretty scary because these, these investments could work out and you have significant payouts or they go bankrupt. And so uh, how do you think about the space and how do you do the research and how do you find opportunities for your portfolio? 
So I think like maybe we can uh, just give an uh, outline for the different stages of the products that biotech uh, companies uh, focus on. I think uh, a lot of uh, the traditional wisdom is biotech very early stage product, still at the discovery. We don't know if there's a drug or not. And, and, and that's some of these companies, it's true. It's where you have the platforms, discovery stage, and those would be very risky and a very long time frame to see a product come out of it. And then when we go into the development stage, clinical stage, there are, as most of people know, there's three stages. Not all the time, by the way, there's sometimes you have accelerated paths towards approval, which is something that we focus on. But if we think about the phase one clinical trial, phase two, you start seeing real data in humans where do you see efficacy of these drugs? And then phase three plus ultimately towards registration. Um, at uh, you know our strategy in Surrey, uh, as we work with Semplify, we really don't focus on the earlier stage stages because it's really hard to underwrite probability of success in, in human uh, uh, trials or ultimately human efficacy. Uh, we really focus on, on, on companies that have products that have some human efficacy data. So we're able to underwrite probability of success for the phase three or registration. Uh, we also focus on specific areas. One of the big areas we focus on are genetic and orphan indications, where there's a lot of uh, advantages, regulatory advantages. Traditionally, people, again, phase one, phase two, phase three. Sometimes with orphan indication, you can go directly into accelerated registration after a phase two. So that significantly shrinks the time frame towards a commercial product. Also pricing is very attractive in this specific area. This is one of the main areas. We focus on five other areas. But I wanna highlight that it's not always when you hear biotech that it's binary, it's gonna work or it's not gonna work. Maybe if it's very early when you're st still testing on animals, which we don't touch, that might be the case. But when you're at a later stage, you go into the iterative process where you build on information and you, you start building confidence, confidence to ultimately get into commercial products. And this is where we focus on. And we've, uh, I think Paul is happy. We've been uh, in a very tough area. Mm -hmm. I have to say it's very, very tough. Uh, I wouldn't recommend people, if you don't have the technical skills, if you don't have the team, we have people from, we build a tremendous team that, you know, uh, Ron Farkas, who came from the FDA with 20 years of experience. Shui Hua, she's the drug developer and a clinical strategist. Having these technical expertise and much more, including commercial expertise within the team, having that comprehensive knowledge is what's, I think, enabling us to pick uh, companies that we feel confident and we have high conviction in. Also, the portfolio effect. And we do run basically risk analysis and we manage the carries ratio and risk ratios in our portfolio overall. Because while we think we're really good, uh, we're gonna miss sometimes. And that's why we're important. We need to think about the specific positions that we build and ultimately the overall portfolio. And when our companies, which we are gonna have a couple this year that will have uh, registration and ultimately go into commercialization, when some of the larger companies that Mike focus on either acquire or these companies grow into that space. Oh, I do little ones too. <laughs> yeah, you have full sure. we, we share that one. <laughs> yeah. I, not, not a lot. I'm very selective <laughs> because, you know, these, it's your money and we need to manage it properly. One thing that really surprises me, and you mentioned the incredible talent that you have on your team. And when I was running a hedge fund, we were very similar where we had expert on top of expert, and many of them I handpicked, I trained over a 15 year period. It always shocks me how many retail investors are heavily invested occasionally in these biotech ideas without maybe knowing the knowledge base that's on the other side, doing so much due diligence. I'm always surprised when people come to me in the social media and ask me about this small biotech or that small biotech, and I'm scratching my head. I'm like, how could you possibly have the wherewithal to be betting hundreds of thousands of dollars of your personal money on this? And it's funny, I'm a proponent of all of this innovation, and it's 
we've had an incredible renaissance. We're in a golden period of development and discovery right now, and it's not going to stop. It's just going to accelerate from here. Um, but I'm shocked that they are able to have the um, testicular fortitude, if you will, <laughs> to, um, to actually put those sort of bets on without that incredible pool of expertise that many like we have. Mm -hmm. So are, are you surprised by that? or? I mean, I get you know, the same questions as, as people send me different tickers. What do you think about this and that? And they expect me to answer within like 10, 15 minutes. Yes. We spend a lot of time on these companies, especially the small uh, companies. You have to fully understand not only the science, you have to understand the operational risk, the team, spend a lot of time. And this is where we have the advantage, I think. If, if we go to large cap companies, it's very hard or very rare uh, to have the opportunity to interact with the CEOs of these companies. A lot of the portfolio, com I have the CEO cell phone number. I could call them anytime. Whenever I see a movement, I could call and ask what's going on. And that's great, I think, in our space. Also, what we've seen in the last couple of years, there has been a shift from follow-on offerings toward private placement in public companies. And that's a great you know, space to be in. And I'm so glad Paul and his team were able to build the infrastructure within Surrey that enable us to access these deals um, because this is where we can gain uh, information for a period of time. Of course, we get cleansed once the pipe is announced, but we, we gain a lot of information and then we make a knowledgeable investment more than what we just see in the reports or the filings of, of the company. Um, and it's a lot of work. Like we don't, it's not that we just see a ticker, we like the sound of it and we invest. We do a lot of work, we look at the science, the clinical data, the team. We do a lot of work, I'm not gonna share everything, but also there's a lot of layers of how we understand the quality of operating a program, which is, I think, as uh, Mike highlighted, some retail investors don't appreciate that risk and how we can underwrite and evaluate how good a company is in minimizing that risk. Kind of the beauty to it, for the most part, um, aside from some of the more exotic approaches, it's the same for drug development all the time. You have a target that you're trying to interact with in the body to cause some sort of biological event downstream. My hand is that target. And then you have a drug, and th this is the candidate drug. And do you have engagement? How tight is that engagement? And then what is the downstream effect? Um, and now with the animal models we have in the preclinical and so forth, it's gotten so good that the error rate uh, is very low. Uh, and then, of course, lastly, does it kill people? And that's what we're always very keen on that. Uh, so it, it's gotten very regiment now. Very few drugs kill people, by the way, when they reach the clinic. I just want to highlight very no, few drugs. Well, very few approved <laughs> drugs kill people. But, or in uh, clinical trials. Like there's the FDA. This is the main thing they focus yeah. on, but sometimes it happens. I, I'm saying it hyperbole, but I, when I was doing this, uh, like, like you, I did this every day, and I did drug development before I was investing, and I always called it the purple eyeball. All right, because the purple eyeball is that one in a thousand event that you never saw coming, and you're like, what's wrong with that patient? Oh, he's got a purple eyeball. I don't know. But they get, drugs get killed for that. And sometimes it's just noise, but the FDA gets very upset. I mean, it's their job to get upset. Well, maybe, maybe we could kind of take it, I mean, we all experienced COVID and, and certainly a lot of controversy around some of the development and the testing and things like that. Maybe give us a sense of how the world has changed post-COVID with therapy therapy and computational power. And I mean, we witnessed typical drugs take decades to come to market, and we did it in less than a year. Uh, so maybe go through that kind of post. What do you see post-COVID? I, I will say this. I don't know if you agree. I've been pretty vocal about this in many forums. If those vaccines, uh, the mRNA vaccines, were up for approval right now, I do not believe that they would get approved. That's that's it, because I think that the risk benefit at this point is not there. Uh, so th that was an incredible moment in science where we had a true panic attack uh, for something that was lethal and very dangerous and could greatly harm the economy. What do we do? And I think they did a great job. 
So even though I don't think it should be approved now, at the time, knowing what we knew, I thought it was an incredible endeavor to put all that together in such a short period of time. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I mean, for the most part, this doesn't kill people. There are side effects that can be horrific and material, right. and they're more frequent than we thought. Uh, so it is a, I mean, a dangerous vaccine to a degree, more so than others, like the, the current influenza vaccines, for instance, mm -hmm. are very safe. Uh, you don't have these strange cardio events and prolonged immunocompromised events that we keep seeing in the data. Uh, but I have to applaud the FDA for what they did uh, under duress, is right. that they did the best they could and put together something that was very cogent and incredibly helpful. Does that MR? Oh, go ahead. Need go ahead. No, I also wanted to highlight that it's it's not just the approval process for the COVID vaccines because uh, AstraZeneca, the, the, by the way, vaccine is very similar to the same attenuation viruses to the traditional virus flu uh, vaccine, but they still had some effects, side effects. So it's, it could also probably be some aspects of the phenotypes or the COVID virus itself. Uh, but what I've seen, uh, because we interact heavily with management and with these companies and we dig deep into their operations, smart companies have taken advantage of the industry shifts that we've seen after COVID. This industry is the slowest in adopting technology and uh, basically creating efficiencies within the workflows. It's amazing. There's a lot of things that when I used to run my company, I was like, why are we still doing this in this, like, uh, my grandpa used to do the same thing. Now, technology became a big part of this uh, industry, whether it's a preclinical. AI became a real tool in this industry. Still, it's heavily used. Don't believe every company that slaps AI on it. Mm -hmm. But there, there is true uh, ways that AI have been used to make the whole operations more efficient less expensive. I think people are less afraid of going and asking the FDA for creative ways of getting drugs approved, especially smaller companies. I have to say larger companies are slower in adapting. Uh, the FDA itself, if you look at the patterns uh, of how things are getting approved, we're seeing much more flexibility from, from the FDA, which is unusual. Uh, and But I think that COVID taught everyone in the industry to be more efficient, more effective, and, and really accelerated a lot of the time frames that we've seen in, in, uh, in the way that things are, are, are being done in this industry. I think COVID has been really good. Also, the virtual reality that we're still living in, maybe New York, not too much, but the rest of the world still, uh, has created a lot of cost efficiencies in, in this industry and tapping talent so it also kind of uh, neutralized, uh, you know, when you were in the Bay Area, you had the advantage of ta like getting talent and, and all of that. After COVID, you, you've seen a more equal distribution. So you see exciting company in Utah, you see exciting company in uh, areas and cities that you, you, haven't, seen tra you haven't seen it um, uh, before uh, or traditionally. Do you, do you think the uh, CRISPR technology, the mRNA, can be used with other types of diseases where you are going in and genetically altering the DNA structure of an individual? Do you see that coming down the road as well? It's happening, it's happening. right now. One of our companies, RNA, uh, Avidity, uh, they, they have some technologies. Uh, and that's another thing where we're, we're, we're not thinking about, maybe Mike can talk about, about obesity and GLP where it's targeting huge indications, but uh, a lot of these, for example, Alzheimer's and dementia, we think about it as a huge disease, right? Now there's a shift towards defining subpopulation uh, within the disease that we can start treating specifically to that subpopulation. Uh, and a lot of uh, uh, muscular dy dystrophy, there's a lot of technologies mm -hmm. that is using CRISPR. There's cl clinical trials that are globally happening right now. So I think there is a, that's another thing, shifting towards tailored, not individualized per se, but understanding the genetic uh, components that could define a subpopulation within a bigger population that we can start to have more targeted uh, cures, you know, as we think about CRISPR and other technologies. 
Mike? I think the United States sort of has an unfair burden uh, to carry uh, where everyone wants lower health care prices. And this is something that I will be involved in um, next year uh, with the new administration. Uh, but it's so difficult because I get this question a lot, and I have for 25 years, in that, well, eventually everything's going to go to a single payer system. Why well, would I invest in health care? Because the government's going to take it all over like they have in other countries. And for the most part, that's happened across the globe except in the US. Uh, and, and you can see there's a terrible trade off, and it's twofold. Uh, when you have a single payer system like a Canada or the UK, everything becomes rationed. Uh, in the US, if you need a hip or you need a knee, you can get it done in a very timely fashion with minimal suffering. In those countries, you get into a queue, and it can be an extreme years to get what it is that you need. And that's a price that you pay. It's, it's difficult to articulate that to an electorate that wants, you know, cheaper items, and they think that it's better because it is a huge line item. I mean, I pay a fortune for my health care, and I'm sure many of you do too, and it seems unfair. But there's a couple things we get out of that, and that's that we don't get the rationing of health care. And secondly, for our drug purposes, about 97% of all great innovative drug discoveries and development happens right here. The rest of the world in discovery and development has almost disappeared, and certainly disappeared in relative sense versus what happens here in the US. And so all the brains are here, all the innovation is here, all the tools that make that innovation possible. And I'm talking like Thermo Electron and other companies that are making bigger and better machines to figure all this out before it even goes to humans. Uh, we get an incredible benefit to our society. Uh, and it's unfair that we have to carry that for the rest of the world because they won't pay that price. They pay a lower price, we pay a higher price. It's terribly unfair, I agree. It's terribly unfair. But what you get out of it are treatments to treat Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Kids that are going to die at five, six, seven, eight years old can now live much more normal lives. Um, I have a dear friend of mine right now who is in the hospital. I can't name who he is. He's a dear friend. And he has multiple myeloma. And, and I had been walking through him through the process. And I remember 20 years ago talking with Bob Hugan and Jackson uh, at Celgene and how did they develop their drug for multiple myeloma, uh, lanolidomide, which transformed this. People died in five years with multiple myeloma 20 years ago. Yep. That's what you have, five years. And now they die of old age. Mm -hmm. That is one part of healthcare that is incredibly beautiful in America, and that we are going to be able to innovate and innovate the pants off of what was done before, what's done now, and what's done next. So lives will be better, longer, and more fruitful. And, and, and hopefully, we'll get a cure for breast cancer, too. Yeah, but it takes time, it takes effort, it takes money. And uh, I apologize. I feel personally responsible for your health care costs, because <laughs> I've been doing it my whole life and watching this. And I don't know how to solve it terribly easily. It's not easy. Uh, but the rest of the world rides on our coattails of innovation. And they pay less for it. And I don't know what sort of easy solution there is. But um, we pay a price, but we get a tremendous benefit. I'm on drugs right now. I have an autoimmune disorder, and I've been on just about every drug there is. Uh, and I have one that works really well for me. It's a pill. I take it every day. I have no side effects. Thank you very much, Bristol-Myers Squibb. Did a good job. Came out two years ago. Not available anywhere else. Thank God I live here. So, so Mike, maybe... Um... Can you walk us through, since you, you deal with a lot of the companies that most people in the audience would recognize, your Pfizer's, Lilies of the world, can you give us a sense of kind of how you're positioning for the next two or three years? Like, where do you see, you know, great innovation, pricing power? Because you have, you know, devices and, and hospitals and HMOs. Like, it's, yeah. a, it's a broad-based universe. Where, where are you seeing great opportunities today? I think that there are 
incredible idiosyncratic opportunities in the drug arena. Uh, I think there is an incredible amount of innovation. We're in a golden age. Uh, the biggest issue that I see is that you have to pick the winner because the technology has gotten so good now, so quick in this development stage, which is where you're working, that as soon as you've got a good idea and you think you're the one, you're not. There's five others right on your coattails. And so there are many fast followers uh, and you have to figure out which one is going to be the winner. Uh, and that takes a lot of skill. So that's the one thing that I worry about, but the opportunity is, is the innovation is coming fast and furious, the pricing is there, the markets are there, the diagnosis is there, meaning that the patients now, quicker and quicker and quicker, my friend with multiple myeloma, he found he had it in one week. Mm. One week, that's incredible. Yeah. Frequently people will go on for months not understanding what's wrong and so forth. So the diagnosis is much better, much faster. So you, the patients are identified, they're aware. Uh, so I really like the drug space in a very idiosyncratic fashion, meaning I don't like them all. I like the ones that I figure out are good. In med tech, <laughs> I, don't know. I like a breast uh, uh, augmentation company that just, and I'm sorry, I go where the investments are. It's a company, the ticker is ESTA. Uh, they just got uh, uh, this week a uh, new breast approved. It's the first new breast approved in uh, about 11 years on the market. There hasn't been one, but this is a really, really great one uh, because it is no scar. And, and I know this is a vanity item, but I think it's gonna be a great investment item. And that's my job, is to figure out where we can make money. Uh, the doctors are gonna be able to do this under local anesthesia rather than uh, general. And so they're gonna be able to quadruple their throughput in a day. So massively profitable for the doctors, much better outcomes for the patients. There's uh, probably about a 70% reduction in uh, infection rates, which is a huge problem for breast augmentation, uh, so you, and, and then the pricing is there because it's a completely differentiated product. Mm -hmm. Now the bear case is, well, it doesn't matter because the breast market, augmentation market is much smaller now than it was 15 years ago, so it's just not big. My argument is you're wrong. This is going to reignite that market, and, uh, and so I, I, I like that stock an awful lot. I am looking at markets and uh, the risk around trials. I don't do a lot of binary things uh, unless I really think I have the nuts, as I like to say, and we'll have a bet on. Um, I'll give you an example of it's difficult, difficult to deal with right now. Biggest benchmark name in uh, all the benchmarks for healthcare is Lilly. And you might imagine why Lilly made this drug that makes people skinny. How about that, GLP-1? And uh, Lilly is trading at an $840 billion market cap right now. And that's fine. Um, the, the GLP-1 market, though, is trading at 40 times forward. And the GLP-1 market right now is about $52 billion. And I actually think that it's going to be uh, at least $250 billion market. And, and that's way above where the street is in the estimates. So you turn around and say, yeah, we should buy Lilly. The numbers have to go up. It's going to be absolutely huge. It's 14% of the benchmark. Everybody owns it. My problem is that I'm fussing with right now, and this is something we all have to fuss with, is yeah. our allocation. When is everyone going to figure out what you sort of already know? Even if it is $250 billion market, the GLP-1 market, the first generation of drugs goes generic in 2031. You never get your money back in order to justify Lilly's valuation, even here, even though numbers have to go way higher. And so it's this battle right now as a portfolio manager. It's huge in the benchmark. Everyone is there. When are they going to figure out that you never get your money back? So that's sort of a confession of mine to you. And when I'm figuring out the allocation, I'm like, this doesn't make sense. You can't get your money back. Anyway, if anyone has any questions or answers to my question <laughs> as to why that's the case, I'd love to hear it. Lean, how about you within your investable universe? Where do you see like true innovation or potential big catalyst in the space? 
Yeah, I think three three parts in, in the way that we think about uh, investing in biotech. We, we work in a much more innovative uh, space. So companies are usually faster, more nimble, uh, and they're doing something very new. It's not the me too's or something, you know, that more like a large pharma uh, strategy. Uh, one is the diagnostic side. Uh, what we've seen is there a, a big shift in the industry of better defining <coughs> disease, right? Uh, I think 20, 30 years ago, everyone, you would hear people had cancer. You don't go into what type of cancer. Then they went down to the tissue level. Now we, the type of cancer, tissue level, gene, specific mutation, so it's highly defined. And we're seeing this shift across multiple other uh, indications. Uh, so we have a big focus on genetic and orphan indication because we think that this is where almost all of the space is going to go towards, except obesity if, you know, it's, it's <laughs> you know, I think it's, it's very clear the GLP ones are, are, there's a specific mechanism of action. And then the second part, you know, in addition to the orphan indications, it's innovations within the clinical development. Uh, companies are becoming more efficient, uh, more aggressive in finding ways and discussing early with the FDA how they can get the product into the market. And there's a big push now with the FDA for post-market evidence. Uh, I think there's a lot of good drugs out there. Unfortunately, some good drugs fail because of bad operations around it, which we try to remove this risk as we evaluate companies. But uh, we've seen a lot of approvals in the last few months from the FDA, where traditionally we would have not seen it. But the FDA is, be, is asking for post-market uh, um, commitments, and they're asking for these in a more uh, systematic and uh, aggressive way. Before people say, we're going to get to the market, and they never do what the FDA asks them. The FDA right now is becoming more firm about this, which creates opportunities for smaller companies to get to the market and really create a, a more uh, diverse opportunities for, for treatments. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been very exciting to see these companies get, um, we invested in Applied when it was uh, Applied Therapeutics, one of our companies. It's an, a great example where it was in phase three, we looked at all of the data, uh, we discussed their FDA strategy, and now they're gonna, we feel very confident of course, it's never 100%, but their PDFA date is uh, on Thanksgiving. Uh, and uh, you see this progress. And finally, this therapy that they've been working on for three, four years is going to get to children that are in need, uh, orphan indication, no other treatment. Uh, they're getting very favorable pricing. And I think these are the examples that we want to uh, work on and get very excited about. Excellent. Mike, you mentioned GLP-1s, and we talked a little bit before the panel, but at some point, the, maybe by the end of the year, Medicare will start approving these drugs to be used yes, for, for people. I believe so. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about like supply chain goods <laughs> and what, like, how do we get those prices down for folks to use them and, and to be sponsored by medic, medical pro, uh, plans for people? Well, it started organically, actually, Lily. Uh, just recently came out and uh, is offering it in a vial instead of an injector pen, a vial. And uh, it's a lot cheaper. And they're offering it at half price to get it uh, further out to the masses. Uh, a big issue with um, sales uh, for any drug is getting coverage. And you have to get indications approved. Uh, GLP-1s will get uh, very likely approved within the next two quarters for an indication called obstructive sleep apnea for the Medicare population. And, uh, and you know, sleep apnea, you have to wear the CPAP, a lot of people. But what's really interesting about this, this indication and why I think the, the sales are going to ramp dramatically for um, the GLP-1s, and especially Lilly, uh, into next year is because Literally 50% of Medicare uh, patients, and this is millions and millions and millions of people, they should all be on a GLP-1. They're all obese, mm -hmm. half of them. And whether they know it or not, they have sleep apnea. And they have other cardiometabolic uh, signals. Um, and, and frequently a lot of them have some renal impairment, et cetera. All these things that say you should be on a GLP-1. 
And so I think that the sales are going to ramp uh, dramatically uh, with that approval because now you're going to be able to get, uh, you know, you're going to be able to have a, a heavy overset, overweight patient with cardio symptoms that are, you know, the doc knows exactly what they look like. Right. They walk in there and I can't get you a GLP-1, but all of a sudden they know they're overweight. You probably have sleep apnea. So now I have a pathway to get you onto this drug to cure all your other problems right. or at least help you. Yeah. Um, it, it's really, it's a fascinating class um, because is, is it, it solves one? so many problems. I've never seen anything like it, yeah, that's okay. ever, ever. Ever. There hasn't been an innovation like this since Lipitor, since uh, statins, and this is way bigger than that, with much bigger outcomes that are beneficial. Yeah. I wish we had samples for everyone. We could uh, put them in the back of the room. But... Oh, they are pricey. <laughs> It takes, Adam, it takes I, more than one injection <laughs> to, to get it work. But I, I think one thing about what Jeff said, the GLP, uh, Wagovi, which is Lily's drug, is triple G. So it's it's even much better than the typical GLP-1. And, and the unique thing about Lily's strategy is they got on the label obesity, which n no other drug has been able to get it. So this is where the challenge for reimbursement is going to become... Uh, harder, especially for uh, CMS, Medicare, Medicaid. Mm -hmm. uh, the challenge that Lilly is facing today is supply chain, as Jeff highlighted. They, they cannot manufacture enough drug to satisfy. It's, it's a good problem to have, uh, and they're facing compound, like all of these compounded, and the FDA allows for compounded drugs when there's not enough uh, supply. That's why they shifted into um, the vials. But one thing also that you might want to start watching for, there's a, a number of oral drugs that are following. And I'm sure Lilly has tabs on all of these smaller companies that are developing GE because they're going to acquire these competitors. Once we have, I think, oral GLP-1s, which could be done through formulating the, 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 dr the drug that currently is available in the market or creating better versions uh, of the drug. So there's a bunch of companies, we've been watching this space, that are developing oral glp um, once, I don't want to say GLP ones because now it's more than GLP one. It's multiple targets. And that's why we see the significant drop in in, in weight. Um, this could be a very exciting space where these products can be more accessible, more cost efficient, uh, and potentially reduce other costs on our system. Like part of the number that you mentioned earlier, probably 20% of the GDP, 10% is because of all of the cardiovascular. Right. Uh, overweight. So they, they, I think while CMS might not see it immediately, there's going to be long-term cost savings uh, for our system that justifies the reimbursement of these drugs. When she says CMS, she means the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Medicare Services. Medicaid, yeah. mm -hmm. it's, I'm sorry, our whole business is <laughs> jam-packed with acronyms. It's a totally yeah. different language. Mm -hmm. So I always have to try to remind myself of that. I'm bad at it. Yeah, so, so we talked about a lot of great opportunities. And, and I had a question. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, go ahead. I've looked at everything I can in the ones that are working on orals, and everything I find is bad. We're There's one that's good, mm -hmm. but the COGS, the cost of goods sold for that one, that's Viking. They have a great oral that Viking. is going to cost way too much. Viking? Yeah. Yeah, it's not a great company. Don't buy Viking. So. <laughs> okay. Because uh, no, so. no, I looked at this. They have incredible yeah. data. They have incredible yeah. data. It's oral, but it's a peptide, meaning it's a GLP-1 that they've made in a pill format, mm -hmm. and everyone's excited. It's probably like a six, seven billion dollar market cap. Oh, going to buy it. It's going to get taken out. But, you know, nerds, nerds pull out the Excel spreadsheet, and I say, well, how much does it cost to make this peptide, given the lower cost of what an oral will be? So it's going to be about half the price on pricing. And then you figure out their COGS. This is a single-digit margin business. So who the heck, how, why are they even developing this except for hype around their company? No, no. There, so we have other arms in Propel. And sorry, we only do public securities, but we also look at private companies. There are a number of private companies that are developing oral GLPs that are uh, much more... Uh, exciting than the public companies. And uh, one thing around the difference in the cost of goods between cost, cost of manufacturing drugs for oral versus injectable, 
it's very costly to make an injectable. Regardless, even if you have the same drug in an oral, and because you have a you have to have a much more uh, um, controlled environment versus an oral, and this is where where companies can create significant uh, margins as well. Mm -hmm. Just as a reminder, we're not making stock recommendations. We're going to have so. to talk oh, about yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Let these guys do it for you, right? You have yeah. to bring me up to speed on the privates because I don't get to look. Yeah, at we all have of we them. we manage a private fund that so. looks into the private side of things, which gives us a lot of insights, unique insights as we manage Surrey as well, because we can uh, look at the cross information between, which is important, right? When we're investing, as Mike highlighted, when you're investing in a, a small com com company or a micro cap company, you're looking at acquisition opportunity. But if there is a private company that is a competitor, then that reduces the chance of our company. That's why we have that unique, you know, uh, I would say global view over private and, and uh public security. Yeah, we've talked a lot about exciting opportunities. What what are the things that keep you up at night or what risks do you see on the horizon that could disrupt this great story within healthcare? Uh, go ahead. President yeah. Harris, President Harris. <laughs> let's not go there. <laughs> yeah, we're, let's keep no, it we're, we're gonna keep I mean, that would be disruptive <laughs> going to a single payer system. Yeah. yeah. Right. That would be incredibly that you can innovation. Good night. Right. You know that spend the pricing goes down, but then the care gets really bad. Right. Because I, I mean, I moved from the U.S. Uh, from Jordan, and I have to say this country is amazing, regardless of everything that we're seeing, and innovation, entrepreneurship, uh, the people of this country allows for self-correction, and I think while we basically complain too much that everything is expensive here. The healthcare system is very expensive. As Mike highlighted earlier, it is driving a lot of the innovation that we're seeing here. Um, and I always say like having the immigrant lens is very unique because you have this like unique appreciation, even when things, the future appear not like very exciting and November is looming, it, there is a lot of exciting opportunities. And, um, I think I want to reframe the question, what's exciting rather than what's keeping us up, up? There's a lot of things that keep me up at night. I have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but uh, what, what, what is exciting? There's a lot of innovation that this country uh, is focused on. There's a significant industry where, while we think it's only, every industry is focused on profit. Like, I know pharma is being portrayed as the... Uh, you know, I don't know, like more uh, devilish than other industry, but every, like across the board, every industry is focused on profit. But the unique thing about our industry is profit goes back to saving lives. And that's what is exciting yeah. for me. Yeah. Uh, Mike, maybe 30 seconds, non-political risks that you that keep you up at oh. Non-political. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's really no, there's no risk. I mean, uh, you know, to, the, to that system, uh, that infrastructure, it's just political risk because so much of the payment is through government. Sure. That, that is always a issue uh, that can affect valuation. Um, and, and frankly, the, the, the biggest risk for healthcare as a whole is how is what, what's NVIDIA going to do for the quarter? That's the biggest risk to healthcare right, right. because uh, Nvidia takes off, they'll sell healthcare and buy that. You know, so it's really back and forth. Healthcare is a little bit of stuck in the middle, right. and uh, that's really. And so I spent a lot of time watching everything else. Yeah. Okay. Uh, want to wrap up here? I, I do want to give credit to Lean. She probably flew the most number of miles today to get here. She just flew in from London. So thank you for this making morning. it. Thank you. Otherwise, it would have been a fireside chat with Mike. Thank that you was for your time. pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.